Welcome to Club of Med. It's great to see uh, some familiar faces from previous conversations and lots of new folks as well. I'm Charles Mitchell. I'm a professor at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm on the board for TRISEM, Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine, one of the organizing bodies. I study the ecology, ecology of infectious diseases from a community ecology perspective. So I'm really glad you're joining us for Club F Med Conversations. Our goal is to connect the evolutionary medicine community and to share exciting new research. We try to be as informal as possible, and we try to emphasize discussion on a variety of perspectives. And so that's why we call it Club F Med uh, Conversations. So hopefully we can have your questions and discussion as part of this. So Club F Med is organized uh, by the Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine here, uh, also by the International Society for Evolutionary Medicine and Public Health, and eight additional evolutionary medicine centers and programs around the world. And we're happy to welcome our newest collaborators on this, uh, who are the Brazilian Evolution and Health Study Group at the University of Sao Paulo, and also at the University of Kiel, uh, two uh, centers there, the Kiel Evolution Center and a center called TransEvo. So in terms of process for today, uh, we really want to encourage participation. Uh, so we're going to start with a uh, presentation. Um, and you're encouraged to go ahead and ask questions during the presentation. You can either uh, put them in the chat and we'll get to them. It may pop in or uh, may wait till the end or you can um, raise your hand uh, virtually on Zoom as well. And um, those will uh, stay up until we uh, have a chance to answer your uh, question. So with that, oh, and finally, you should feel free to uh, tweet or X about this using hashtag Club of Med. All right, so today it's my uh, real pleasure to welcome Jacques Pepin, who's an infectious disease medicine, uh, physician and epidemiologist. He's now an emeritus professor at the University of Sherbrooke in the province of Quebec in Canada. He's conducted research on a broad array of infectious diseases, uh, especially African trypanosomosis, trypanosomiasis, uh, HIV, uh, other sexually transmitted uh, infections, and C. difficile. Uh, he's documented especially the role of historical colonial era medical interventions in transmission and emergence of infectious diseases. And in 2011, um, he culminated a really huge amount of work in a book, The Origin of AIDS, uh, of which he's now published a second edition in 2021. It's a book that has greatly informed the class that I teach on ecology and evolution of infectious diseases. And I'm excited for us all to hear have the uh, here have the opportunity to uh, discuss this uh, with him. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jacques. He can go ahead and share his screen, and we'll get started. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. I'll try to to get it right now. Okay. So yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to to be here today. So um, uh, my, my talk will focus on colonialism and its role in the emergence of uh, HIV AIDS. So that's an important part of the story, of course. Um, just a, a few notes on toponymy, if I can mention that at the beginning. Uh, a, a lot of the uh, history uh, of the early history of HIV are in uh, a country which a country which is now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo and people call it DRC so I'll use it a, a few times during during my talk DRC during the colonial era it was known as the Belgian Congo shortly after independence it became for the first time the Democratic Republic of the Congo then it became Zaire for about 20 years and now it's it's the DRC its capital city, Kinshasa, during the colonial era was, was known as Leopoldville. And across the river, there is a smaller country called the Republic of Congo, also Congo Brazzaville. Uh, during the colonial era, it was a French colony. It was known as Moyen Congo or Middle Congo, if you want. So as you know, the official birth date of the uh, 
of the AIDS epidemic was the publication of this uh, short paper in the MMWR in June 1981 with a description of five cases of pneumocystis pneumonia among gay men in, in LA. And of course, we now know that the virus had been uh, causing AIDS for many, many decades prior to that. Uh, early on, researchers uh, suspected that the origin of the virus uh, was somewhere in Central Africa. There were several arguments in supporting this hypothesis. The best ones was that when HIV serology uh, became available, researchers tested collection of sera, which had been obtained uh, mostly in the 1970s for other reasons. And to make a long story short, the only samples that contain uh, HIV antibodies uh, before 1980 were all from the, the DRC. And later on, uh, three isolates of HIV were uh, recuperated from uh, all samples, and all three uh, were uh, uh, obtained in Kinshasa. So the 1959 was a blood sample. And the two others, 1960 and 1966, were uh, from lymph node biopsies. Uh, now, the Central African origin of, of HIV became a certainty with the publication of this paper in Science uh, by uh, Beatrice Hahn and her collaborators at the University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham. And basically, she showed that the, the, the animal source of HIV was a chimpanzee, a, a specific subspecies of chimpanzee called pantroglodytes, troglodytes. And the way this was shown was uh, she, they, they had sequences from uh, three chimps who were infected with, with the, the simian virus, SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus. And as you can see in the phylogenetic tree uh, displayed here, the uh, the sequences from pantroglodytes uh, were within the radiation of human isolates of a, a HIV. Uh, this one in blue, which is outside this radiation, was from another subspecies of uh, of Chim Schwanfortii, which, because of that, was was not the uh, the source of uh, of HIV one. So what this means is that the very first case, the one that started the, the pandemic, uh, must have occurred somewhere within the habitat of the uh, pantroglodytes, troglodytes chimpanzee, which are the, the areas shown in orange on this map. So that's the southern part of Cameroon, small part of the Central African Republic, most of Congo Brazzaville, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea. The important point here is that the, the DRC or the Belgian Congo at that time uh, is not inhabited by the pantroglodytes or glodytes chimpanzee. So you have other colors. So they have other species or, or subspecies of chimp in, in, in the DRC. So this means that this was not the location where the first case occurred. Now, the, the group around Beatrice Hans studied the uh, uh, SIV CPZ among wild living chimpanzees. And they, this, they did carry this, carried out this research in, in, in Southern Cameroon. What they found was there was a, a, a lot of variation in the prevalence of SIV CPZ among troops of chimps. And the area where the, with the highest prevalence, around 30%, was in this part of Cameroon, the south southeastern tip of Cameroon that you can see here at the bottom of the slide. And this is also the area where the sequences of SIV CPZ were most similar to human sequences of HIV-1. So for evolutionary biologists, there is no doubt now that the, the very first case of transmission from chimp to man, it occurred somewhere here in Southern Cameroon. And it's close to a, a town called Mulundu. It's not shown on the map, but, but it's about here. 
And just remember that name, Wolundu, I'll mention that later on. Now, HIV-1 is divided into four groups uh, based on uh, divergence of some in nucleic, nucleic acid sequences of something between 35 and 50 percent. Now, the groups, they represent the evolution of the virus within the chimpanzees. Each group uh, also represent a single episode of cross-species transmission event from chimp to man. So for HIV-1 group M, it's not that the virus was transmitted more frequently. There was a single transmission. And then out of this first case, eventually uh, around 80 million people worldwide were infected with with the virus about half of them uh, have already di uh, already died of aids uh, then there is group o uh, around 15000 uh, uh, persons infected with that one and they mostly uh, live in cameroon and then group n also from cameroon about 20 cases and group p also from cameroon two cases now, the, the groups are then divided in, into subtypes, and uh, group, group M basically is divided into nine subtypes. Subtypes have a divergence uh, of something between 17 and 35 percent, and they represent the evolution of the virus within humans. Of course, the most frequent one is subtype C, which is the one found in Southern and Eastern Africa. In North America, Europe, and Haiti, it's subtype B, mostly. And then you have seven other subtypes, which are less frequent. And so far, about 100 recombinants have been identified. And the most important one was the second one to be identified. It's called CRF02AG. Uh, so you, you'll hear about that one also in a few minutes. On this map of Africa, each uh, circle represents a country. And within each circle, uh, each color uh, represents a different subtype. And basically what it shows is that if you look at here, and, and that's for the, the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, basically this is the country with the broadest diversity of HIV subtypes. Basically all subtypes are found there. There is also, a a relatively important diversity across the river. This is Congo Brazzaville. And then you have Cameroon. Uh, and, and you can see that in Cameroon, this color here, it represents a recombinant, which is the predominant uh, variant of HIV in the Cameroon, CRF02. Uh, when <clears throat> progresses uh, were made with uh, sequencing and molecular biology and in general, researchers went back to the to, to to blood samples which had been collected in Kinshasa in the late in the late 1980s. There was a large uh, research project uh, around the Centers for Disease Control, so they they collected a lot of samples for epidemiological studies, and then eventually <clears throat> people went back to these samples and they identified the the subtypes of HIV and basically. All nine subtypes were found in Kinshasa, many recombinants also. And basically, there was more diversity of HIV in Kinshasa 30, 35 years ago than there is now anywhere else in the world. So that was already a, a very strong argument in favor of the, uh, of the idea that the pandemic started in Kinshasa. And this was made certain with the publication of this paper in Science about 10 years ago. Um, and these researchers, they, <clears throat> they used more than 500 uh, sequences from uh, HIV infected persons from Central Africa. And this confirmed without any doubt now that the starting point of the pandemic was Leopoldville or Kinshasa. Even if the patient, the very first patient, the one, who, the mythical patient zero was clearly infected in Southeast Cameroon. And they estimated that the virus, HIV-1, arrived in Leopoldville around uh, 1920 with the confidence interval, which is shown here, between 1909 and 1930. 
And it took about 15 years for the, the virus to spread successfully uh, to Brazzaville across the river and to other cities in the, uh, in the Belgian Congo. On this uh, slide, you have a map showing not the territory, well, the, you can see, you can guess the, 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 the limits of the DRC, but what's shown in, in green, it's the Congo Basin, so the areas of land where the rivers drain into the Congo River. So you can see it's huge. It goes far beyond the borders of the DRC, and that includes southern Cameroon. What you have here is the site of the first of, of the cross species transmission from Chimtuman for Group M. So that's as you can see, it's around Mulundu. You can see that groups P, O, and N, and N, sorry, uh, it also started in Cameroon, as I mentioned. For group O and P, this was beyond the territory of the Congo Basin. For group N, it was just on the edges of it. So in the colonial era, the, the trade from that part of uh, southeastern Cameroon it was it was made by river all the way down to Leopoldville and Brazzaville because there was no, there was no road to get to uh, to Molundu. So in the first edition of my book, I speculated that there had been some transmission around Molundu, uh, sexual transmission, and perhaps some parenteral transmission as well. And eventually, from a very from a first case, there were a few dozen cases such that inevitably one of these infected persons uh, traveled down the river to uh, to Leopoldville, and then started the transmission in the capital of the uh, Belgian Congo. Now, that was not completely convincing, and, and the reason for that is what I, I, I I'm calling the Cameroonian paradox. So. Even though this was the country where, where, where you have the sites of, of cross species transmission for all four groups of HIV-1, and more importantly uh, for HIV-1 group M, the virus completely disappeared from Cameroon for about 50, 55 years. And Cameroon got infected only in the 1970s and 1980s when HIV-1 was re-exported from the DRC to Cameroon. And the, the main strain was the, rec uh, the recombinant CRF02. And of course, uh, recombinant is more recent than its uh, ancestors. So that was very strange. How was it possible for, for, for the epidemic to have started there and then completely disappear, not only from Cameroon, but for other adjacent countries such as uh, Central African Republic and, and the Republic of Congo. And, and then to start the epidemic uh, much further down the river. And <clears throat> while working for the second edition of the book, I've uncovered what, what I believe is the explanation. So uh, in 1914, when uh, World War One uh, broke out, the uh, the European powers, so Britain, France, Belgium, decided to invade uh, the German colonies of Africa, and that included Cameroon, which was a German colony at the time. And what you see here are, are the, the armies, the colonial armies, and now some of these are quote-unquote German soldiers, and some of them are French soldiers, and some of them are quote-unquote Belgium soldiers. They all look the same. And so you have the African soldiers and, and a few uh, white uh, European officers. And that's, that was really colonialism at its worst. So these soldiers, some of them were volunteers, but many of them were conscripts. They were, they were forced to fight a war that they, they had nothing to do with and they, they basically didn't know uh, much about the uh, the countries in uh, in uh, in Europe and the reasons they were uh, fighting each other. Now, the important component of the conflict 
uh, is uh, the invasion of, of Southeast Cameroon. Uh, the Allied invaded Cameroon from several different directions, the, but the one which is important is, is the force that went into Southeast Cameroon. So basically, the French and the Belgians together, they, they, well, they, they had a, a number of their soldiers, African soldiers, uh, they were put in, uh, into boats, and these boats went upriver, up the Congo River, and eventually uh, they turned left on a river which is called the Sangha, which is a, a tributary of the Congo River. And then the boats went upriver to, uh, all the way to Mulundu in, uh, in southeastern Cameroon. And in Mulundu, they spent a few months and eventually, Molundu was the end of the navigation. So after Molundu, uh, transportation was on foot. So they walked all the way and fought some small battles against the Germans. And eventually, all the way to Yaoundé, where in 1916, the Germans uh, surrendered. And after the conflict, the soldiers were brought to Douala, the major port in Cameroon, and they and they they were put uh, into a into a number of boats and the boats carried them back to to the Congo and eventually they went all the way back to Leopoldville Brazzaville and they stayed most of these troops stayed there for a few months and they came back in 1916 so in uh, it's, it's possible it was possible to find a lot of information about this this part of the world, uh, World War One, because um, uh, the French wrote a history of World War One. That's the French uh, military. Uh, it contains 107 volumes and six, 76,000 pages, and that includes about 6,000 pages uh, uh, about the, the 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 war in Cameroon, which was a very small component, of course, of World War One. So basically, they had 1,000 soldiers from the French colony of Moyen Congo, 600 soldiers from uh, from the Belgian Congo, about 100 French officers and about 10 uh, Belgian officers, and they had about 4,000 porters. So people, uh, civilians, who were forced to carry weapons on their back, ammunition, food, and even wine for the European officers. Molundu was, as I mentioned, was the terminus for river transportation. It was the area in Central Africa with the lowest population density. And in any case, the inhabitants had fled to avoid the war. And the crops uh, which were left there when the Germans left, well, the Germans had destroyed these crops. So they were getting some food by river, but that was not sufficient. And there was a uh, a very serious famine among the the soldiers. So basically, they all went hunting in the local forests. So suddenly, compared to the antebellum situation, the number of persons with with weapons and ammunition uh, who would go hunting in the forest had been multiplied at least uh, one hundred fold. So I believe, and that's. I think that by far the best explanation for the beginning of the pandemic, I believe that the uh, the, the, the mythical cut hunter was in fact a cut soldier, and that if, if chimpanzee zero was uh, was indeed Cameroonian, then patient zero was a Congolese, either from uh, Moyen Congo or from the Belgian Congo, or perhaps even a, a, a Belgian or a French officer, and. This person who was infected in Southeast Cameroon uh, eventually went back to uh, Leopoldville in 1916, where he started a chain of, of transmission that eventually uh, led to the, uh, to the pandemic. I believe this is the explanation because it is parsimonious. You, you basically, you don't need a lot. You just need one of these soldiers to get infected and and to 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 bring back the the virus to to Kinshasa. So it's 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 very it's a very simple scenario, uh, given all the facts that I've mentioned about the about the the, the, the World War One. 
Now, let, well, now we'll, we'll move to uh, Kinshasa and, and Brazzaville, but mostly Kinshasa. So on, on this photograph, you can see that this is Kinshasa here, Brazzaville on the northern shore of the river. And it's basically the terminus for the navigation on the very huge Congo Basin, which, which I showed in the previous slide, because there are rapids right here. So that's the end of the navigation. So Kinshasa, at the time of the arrival of the, the virus in 19, around 1916, its population was about 14,000. And right now, its population is about between somewhere between 16 and 17 million. So over a century, its population was multiplied at least a thousand fold. Now, this is on this uh, slide, you have uh, a graph showing what's thought to be the evolution of the infected population in Kinshasa. That's from a study by M Michael Warby from the University of Arizona in Tucson. And what it shows is that uh, uh, the virus arrived around 1916 or perhaps 1920. And then there was a very slow increase in the number of infected persons in, in Kinshasa, very slow for, for about 30 or 35 years. And then in the early 1950s, there was a, an exponential increase in the number of, uh, of persons infected. This is a logarithmic scale. So what you see here is an exponential amplification of the number of infected people. And then eventually it plateaued. So that's what could be uh, 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 reconstituted from, from the analysis of HIV-1 sequences. Now, what happened now, let's go back to the colonial history. What happened was that the Belgians uh, developed Leopoldville as basically as a war camp. They wanted to avoid trouble, they wanted to have in Leopoldville only the people who were needed for the colonial enterprises, so either for the private companies or, or for the government. So basically, they wanted only the men who were needed by employers, and they didn't want women. The women were not that interesting. They, they, they didn't work for the colonial enterprises. So there were lots of... Uh, constraints on the movement of people into Leopoldville. They, they were all kind of permits that they needed to get there. So what happened is that there was a, a, a male to female ratio uh, in throughout the colonial period, which, which was around two for most of that period. So you have two men for, for, for each woman. But if you remove from these calculations the married man and the married woman, and you look, look just at, at the single person, so the bachelors, the, the divorce, and the widow, and the widow, there was something like 10 men for each woman. The consequences were predictable. Uh, there was the development in, in Kinshasa of a, a specific type of prostitution, so they were uh, they, they were called in French femme libre, so free women. The way they operated is that they had about two, two, three or four regular patrons. Each of them would, would visit the free woman maybe once a week. The woman would uh, prepare food for this man, would, would take care of the laundry, and of course there would be sex at the, at the end of the visit. So in exchange for that, these men would provide the women some uh, kind of regular financial support. So they were, you know, they would get money every month instead of being paid for each uh, intercourse. What I can tell you is that this was sufficient certainly for the persistence of HIV through sexual transmission. Uh, the slow expansion that, that I've shown you between 1916 and 1950, but this type of, uh, of sexual network that was not sufficient for the exponential amplification, which I showed in the 1950s. So my interest in parenteral transmission of bloodborne viruses started when I read this paper in The Lancet about 20 years ago, and that's about hepatitis C in Egypt. And what, what the, the, the researchers showed was that 
uh, what, uh, through uh, medical interventions for the control of schistosomiasis, so a parasitic disease. Uh, there were campaigns to try to eradicate this disease. So people in the endemic areas were screened for schisto, and then they were treated with intravenous drugs. And eventually, in the regions which were most uh, the, the, with the highest endemicity for schisto, half of the population got infected with the hepatitis C virus. They were also uh, at about the same time studies in Cameroon. Now we're getting closer to the origin of HIV. In Cameroon, uh, in many communities in Cameroon, if you look at, at persons who were old enough, so born in the 1940s and the 1950s, <clears throat> the same thing, up to 50% of, of the people were uh, infected with HIV. So what happened is that the, the drugs which were used at the time to treat various infectious diseases, they were not very effective. So to get the maximal effect, they had to be given intravenously. There was no knowledge then about bloodborne viruses. And the patients who got HCV, when you get acute HCV, they, you don't get very sick. There is no jaundice. You just get a bit, uh, maybe a fever for a, a week and, and that's it. So, so the doctors couldn't recognize that they were causing hepatitis C transmission. So if it occurred for HCV, then it's quite reasonable to think that it, it might have occurred for HIV as well. So of course, it's not possible to study HIV transmission through colonial era medical interventions because it's, it's lethal. It's, it will kill almost all infected persons within 10 to 15 years of of infection. So what I did is I use other viruses, which, although they are pathogenic, they are also compatible with survival for a, a, a reasonable proportion of, of the infected population. So uh, in three different countries, Guinea-Bissau, Central African Republic, and Cameroon, with three different viruses, HIV-2, HTLV-1, and HCV, I was able to show that uh, infection with these viruses were related to colonial era interventions. So, for example, the treatment of African trypanosomiasis, the treatment of TB with intramuscular streptomycin, the use of pentamidine as a prevention for sleeping sickness. Uh, again, in Central African Republic, the treatment of African trypanosomiasis, in Cameroon, uh, IV treatment for malaria. And these were uh, interventions that had occurred 40 to 50 years earlier. So uh, the fact that it was possible to document that after such a long, long interval, despite many of the infected persons having died, well, it showed that the, the, these risk factors uh, were very important uh, in, in the 1950s and 1960s. In Kinshasa, which is really the central part of our story, there were a number of, uh, of medical facilities that were uh, using a lot of injections. One of them was the STD clinic. This is the, the what it looked like in the 1950s. And basically, the Belgians were obsessed with syphilis, with the control of syphilis. And these women are free women, so they were semi-prostitutes, and they were forced to go there every month and be tested for, for syphilis. And then when they had a positive serology, they were treated with a series of intravenous injections of arsenical drugs. And the peak was uh, in 1953, when more than 150,000 injections were made in the small facility, which is shown in the on the uh, left-hand corner. Uh, there were other institutions involved as well. This, is, this was the major hospital in, in Leopoldville, uh, which was called the Hôpital des Noirs, so Hospital for Blacks. And this was the hospital here on the, on, on the left side. And this was the public health laboratory. And it was also a, a research center on on tropical diseases. And 
to sort that out. After the the three previous studies, which I mentioned, I went to uh, I went to Kinshasa in 2012 with uh, two medical residents, and we did the same thing. But this time, we looked at people living in Kinshasa. They were long term residents of of Kinshasa who had lived there for <clears throat> for at least 50 years, and they would themselves age at least 70 years, and uh, not only did we do serology, but we also, uh, for the HCV uh, positive samples, we amplified uh, part of the genomes and we sequenced it. So it was, possi it was possible to identify subtypes of hepatitis C. And we did the same thing for HTLV1 as well. And basically, we, again, we're looking at colonial era intervention. So so, for example, subtype hepatitis C subtype for for R was transmitted in a specific hospital called Kitembo. Subtype for Q was transmitted in another hospital, which was called Onatra. HTLV1 was transmitted in in two di distinct hospitals, including the one, the big one, which I just showed you. Uh, some of the Persons were infected through uh, injections for the treatment of TB. Uh, it was related to in injections, intravenous injections, which had been received prior to 1960, so 60 years earlier. And injections at the STD clinic was also a risk factor. And we, we did the same thing as what had been done for, uh, for HIV. So you have a curve showing the evolution of the uh, infected population infected with HGV subtype 4K. And basically, it showed the same thing. So uh, a very stable uh, population infected. And then starting in the, in the early 19, 1950s, at exactly the same time as for HIV-1, there was an exponential amplification of the infected population. So basically, this suggests strongly that this part here in the 1950s, this part of the amplification uh, of HIV-1 was through parenteral transmission. What happened thereafter was related also to the colonial history of, of the country. So in, in June 1960, the country became independent. This man here, Patrice Lumumba, he was the prime minister at, on the day of independence. A few months later, you can see him uh, in the uh, in, in the uh, in a truck, in a military truck, in a in a, a difficult situation for him, and he would be eventually uh, assassinated a couple of months after this uh, photograph was taken. So there was a mutiny of the army, secession of the Katanga. Civil War, a very large number of refugees uh, came into Leopoldville, which was safer. There was massive unemployment in, in Leopoldville, so all of a sudden the unemployment rate rose from 5% to 50%. There was a lot of poverty, and this had an impact on the face of prostitution in, in Leopoldville. So basically, uh, the, the men didn't have enough money to, to uh, to pay a, a monthly uh, "quote unquote" salary to the free women, so uh, they, they they paid sex for each intercourse. The number of women willing to sell sexual services also increased tremendously. So you had sex workers that were having three or four clients per day instead of three or four per year. So three or four per day that means one thousand fifteen hundred fifteen hundred per year. So I believe that in the 1960s, the amplification of HIV-1 was then mostly sexual. So 1950s parenteral, 1960s sexual, and that occurred in the core groups. So the, the women selling sex and the, the men buying sex. In the 1970s, this was the generalization of HIV-1. So it, it moved from the score group into the general population. And we know that from uh, testing of women who were bringing their, their kids to an, uh, to an under five clinic. And basically the prevalence among these women was 
0.25% in 70, it went up to 3% in 1980. Following this strife in the uh, in the newly independent Congo, all the Belgian all the Belgian doctors, teachers, nurses, they all left suddenly, fearing for their life. And they had to be replaced. And eventually, the United Nations uh, agencies and later on, the Congo government hired technical assistants. And many of them were recruited from Haiti. And what you have in the bottom part of the slide is a newspaper, English language, weekly newspaper in, in Port-au-Prince. And that's an issue of March 1961. And there is this photograph of the contingent, the first contingent of Asian teachers who went to the Congo. And over the, uh, during the 1960s, about four and a half thousand Asians went to work in the Congo, most of them for, for a few years in, in the country. It's now certain that this is how the virus was eventually exported out of Africa into the, into the Americas. And so it, it, this was through Haiti. And evolutionary biologists told us, tell us that this occurred around 1967. There was a rapid an incredible amplification of the infected population. So from a single case in 1967, in Port-au-Prince, in 1982, there was something like 20,000 infected persons, HIV infected persons in Port-au-Prince. And if you had an unknown number infected in the rest of the country, uh, there was an extremely rapid increase in the number of infected HIV infected persons. And I believe that the amplification mechanism in this case was through a, a company called Emo Caribbean, which was involved in the in the plasma trade. Eventually, uh, in the late 1960s and, and early 1970s, Haiti was a popular destination for homosexual tourism. So this is certainly the way it was exported out of Haiti into the United States. And again, the work by Michael Warraby tells us that the virus arrived in New York around 1971. And from there, a few years later, it, it went, it traveled uh, to California. So it arrived in California around 1974, 1975. And then it takes eight, seven, eight, ten years before you develop AIDS, and eventually the infected gay man in uh, in LA developed AIDS, and eventually the disease was recognized, and this was the beginning of uh, of, of AIDS in the uh, in the United States. So this is my last slide. So I'll be able, I'll be happy to take uh, take your questions. Uh, Took me about 40 minutes, so not so bad. So uh, yeah, I'll be happy to take your questions now. All right, thank you. So we'll be happy to take questions. You can put them in the chat or raise your hand and we can uh, call on you. And um, I would uh, suggest um, uh, that we might uh, take, well, should we leave the screen share up or take it down? Do you, um, I'd suggest uh, we stop the screen share yeah. so we can see the audience. Okay. Yeah, if you could take that down, that would be uh, great. Stop share. Okay, there we are. And uh, for those who are willing, uh, turning on your uh, camera would be nice as well, so we can we can see who's asking questions and and see who's here. All right, uh, we've, we've got one from Margaret Humphreys. Uh, Margaret, do you want to unmute and ask her? Do you want me to read it? Um. Let's see. Start video. You can see my red hoodie. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have followed this story with great interest. Um, read the first edition of your book when it came out and just said, wow. <laughs> um, one thing I was interested in, you didn't cite here, but of course talk about in your book is the problems with sterilizing syringes when you were giving I am um, drugs. And my father was a dentist who sterilized his needles in just that same sort of um, heated bath uh, when he gave 
inoculate and gave anesthetic for teeth. So I knew of which you spoke. Um, I teach a course on the history of global health, and I can give this this part of the story, maybe one or two classes. I'm teaching Duke students who don't really know how to read anymore or don't have much, don't have a whole lot of patience for a long text. Um, what would you assign to them? Is there a video where you talk about this or another place that is summarizes it to, to tell the story? Or does your new, the new version of your book, which I haven't seen, should that be where I go? Thanks. Yeah, well, you, you could use the uh, what was recorded today that I, I don't mind if you want to share it with your uh, with your students. Uh, the the second edition, uh, I tried to shorten the the parts about molecular biology because I knew this was difficult for the uh, average uh, reader. Uh, then the, the so, some some uh, parts of the story were added. For example, what I told you about uh, World War One in Cameroon. And then the uh, the publisher agreed to have photographs, so I've added about uh, twenty five photographs, which which uh, which makes it easier to 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 try to understand what was what what was life like in the Congo at the time and and uh, and so on. So I think the second edition is is a bit easier to read than the uh, the first one, and the photographs make it. Uh, Kind of nicer, but for uh, for your students, uh, <laughs> I think that's that's the best I can offer, and and then uh, uh, they can listen to this uh, this talk. I don't mind. Yes, of course, so they, of course they don't need they don't need to write anymore, and they can use in, in artificial intelligence. So <laughs> <laughs> so life is easier for them. <laughs> Okay, we have a question in the chat from uh, Sophia uh, Cotherio. Um, after that, we'll go to a hand raised by Chelsea Wood. Uh, Sophia, do you want to unmute and ask it, or should I read it? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Awesome presentation. I'm just wondering, those very early sam uh, strains that were from samples in the 50s and 60s, are there any metadata that might hint on possible transmission, like the gender or age or or symptoms. Thank you. So I'm not sure I understood. So you're saying what? What can these samples, these old samples, be used to understand how it was transmitted? Hmm. Yeah, and specifically, she was asking. Um, if the identity of the samples is known in terms of their age, gender, whether they had symptoms, a cause of mortality, uh, any other information about these samples besides the HIV sequences that okay. can be used? Well, the one from 1959 was a man. It was obtained in, uh, in the course of a study on uh, hemoglobinopathies, so diseases of, the, uh, of hemoglobin. And it was in Kinshasa. I think they had obtained about 100 samples in, in Kinshasa, and one of them was uh, was uh, infected. Was uh, infected. We we don't know anything else about this man. The the other two uh, patients, I think they were both females. Not sure. At least one of them, but I think both of them were were women. And these were lymph node biopsies. So. Why would somebody with HIV have a, a lymph node biopsy? There are many, uh, well, maybe the most likely uh, explanation would be that they, they got TB and maybe they had TB lymphadenitis and there was a biopsy to, to prove that diagnosis or maybe they had some other uh, uh, opportunistic infection that, that caused uh, uh, enlarged uh, lymph nodes. And so they, they, they might have been this might have been related to to HIV infection, or maybe they also got TB just coincidentally, and then, so we don't know much about these uh, these patients, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chelsea, go ahead and unmute. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. That was really really interesting. Um, I'm an ecologist, and so I'm interested in the lead up to spillover, the conditions that led to that initial 
spillover event. And it sounds like your argument is that the spark for, for spillover was enhanced levels of human and wildlife contact um, in the early part of the 20th century. I wonder if I can ask you to speculate a little bit on what this means for the pathogens that could be spilling over right now, based on you know what we've learned about HIV, what does it suggest to you about where we should be worried for the future? Well, uh, the, the major spillover um, event in the rec in recent years was, uh, of course, COVID nineteen. So, uh, I think the interesting part of the COVID nineteen story is that the uh, there had been the the first. SARS epidemic uh, uh, maybe 15, 20 years earlier in China. And, and this first one clearly was related to the uh, the sale of, uh, of various types of uh, animal food in, in uh, markets, in what they call wet markets. And these markets were closed for a few years and then reopened. And then eventually, it might have been the source, uh, the location of the the beginning of COVID-19. Now, it's uh, I agree it's unclear whether this was related to this market in Wuhan or whether this was a lab leak. I think it's quite possible that it was a lab leak. But in any case, what, what the COVID-19 uh, story shows was that there was a uh, uh, I mean, humans are not very good at uh, learning lessons from the past, and they they reopen these wet markets with all you know maybe one hundred different animal species sold within a very uh, small uh, small uh, area, and so it shows that uh, we're not very uh, the human race is not very wise when uh, about uh, changing uh, its be its behavior, unfortunately, and of course they are other examples of that, climate change and, and so on. Okay, we'll take uh, one from Jonathan Parr. You can go ahead and unmute. After that, we'll go back to the chat for one from Michelle Blythe. Sure. Um, Jacques, thanks so much for that, that great talk. And um, I just want to say thank you also for helping our group in the DRC with our early Hep C work, uh, you and your colleague, Eric Frost, uh, yeah. made that possible. Um, so a self-serving question, um, from that work, you helped us launch the AIDS control program uh, several years ago. Afterwards, I asked us to start investigating hepatitis B um, with an eye towards improving hepatitis B care in the DRC. And I was hoping you might um, comment or speculate about uh, Hep B history in the DRC. I know that wasn't the topic of this talk, but um, you're very sage about uh, these complex histories. I'm just curious. Um, uh, to hear your response. C Camille Morgan, by the way, is on the call and she lived in Kinshasa last year uh, in uh, the Kintambo offices with some of the original Pro-J CETA team. And then our malaria offices are in Mama Yemo, uh, which you showed a picture of, I'm pretty sure. Um, so just to say, Camille and I have been texting back and forth urgently during your talk with great interest. Okay, so I was curious about hepatitis B. Okay, well, th thanks for the for the, the comment. Hepatitis B, I, I think really th there was a lot of transmission through uh, through medical injections as well. I think it's what happened with Hep B was that uh, probably most of the infections occurred in children, and well, when children develop uh, acute HBV infection, they're not very sick; they don't get jaundice. So I think it's quite uh, plausible that. A lot of this was through uh, medical uh, medical injections, and of course, in many parts of Africa, up at least until the 1990s, B infection was universal. You couldn't avoid the virus, so you had maybe 15 percent of the adults with who were uh, HBSAG carriers, and, and and all of the others uh, had antibodies, so it was a universal infection. They were, they, of course, it's it's more it's it's more trans, transmissible than HIV and 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 than HIV. So there were other modes of transmission as well. Uh, of course, uh, vertical transmission from from uh, from mothers to their children and so on. But I, I believe that there was a lot of uh, parenteral transmission as well. And now with the with the immunization, of course, it's it's uh, 
it's uh, receding. It's I'm not sure if it's if it will eventually disappear. I, I believe so with the uh, with the uh, immunization. And yes, of course, the 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 what the the photograph I showed was Mama Yemo uh, Hospital. The, uh, just an anecdote. Mama Yemo was the the name of the mother of Mobutu. So when when he was overthrown. It, it no longer was Mama Yemu Hospital. Now I think it's called General Hospital and and so on. And in the I told I mentioned Projet Sida, which was really a, a major research project in the in the 1980s. And and the their office and their lab was somewhere in that uh, that same building. So yeah. So yeah, I, th I think at the, certainly at, the, at this time there was must have been a lot of transmission through these uh, injections. And of course, there were also major epidemics of uh, of hepatitis B related to injections in in uh, in developed countries in in the UK during World War II, and then during World War II you also had this episode in the US when. Uh, I think about 300,000 soldiers were infected with HBV through uh, a vaccine for yellow fever, which had been uh, developed using serum from uh, medical students. So yeah, there are many, many reasons to believe that there was a massive transmission of HBV through uh, medical injections uh, in, in the 1940s, 50s. Great. We have just one minute more. So I'll read the uh, question from Michelle Blythe and thank her for asking it. Uh, she asks, I'm curious about HIV-2 and how it differs from this story. Uh, so it's a, yeah, uh, if you keep it to one uh, one minute, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Well, HIV-2, it's, 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 it's far less transmissible through sex than HIV-1. So for HIV-2, I think parenteral transmission, especially in, in Guinea-Bissau and surrounding countries, I think that was by far the main mode of transmission. And that is also the reason why it's disappearing. It's because parental transmission has stopped, and then you only have sexual transmission, and it's not very effective. So this is a virus which is going to disappear. So in this case, this was to a large extent, uh, an epidemic uh, created by uh, medical interventions. Wonderful. Thank you, Jacques, so much. Please, everyone, okay. thank Jacques for a wonderful presentation and discussion. And thank all of you for joining us in this Club, Club of Med discussion. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, as uh, Johnny chat, uh, chatted next Friday, uh, Frank really will be speaking on One Health. Thanks everyone. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye everyone, good to see everybody. Bye-bye, thank you.